Hello again, everyone. Um, now we're moving to the paper review part two, where we studied uh, a new paper with a nice uh, experimental section. This paper is called Genetic Programming Approaches for Learning Classifiers. They are creating programs to do classifiers that are fair. And it was proposed by William Aklava and Jason Moore. So why did I find this paper interesting to show you guys? Um, the first reason is that the paper um, experiments are described well in the abstract, also in the introduction, and then in the experimental section. So this makes the development of the experiment, the ideas, very smooth. You get the first insight the first time you read, you read about it in the, abstraction, in the abstract. When you move to the introduction, you get a little bit more details, we reinforce the idea, and then finally, when we get to experimental section, uh, we have a very strong understanding of what the paper did. Then they also use a, a wide set of tools to describe the results of the statistical tests. They use figures, tests, and tables in different ways to show what we have to see. They have a good use of figures and results to support the main finding of the paper. So they the they are always connecting figures, results, tables, results, mentioning frequently what is the main finding. You're going to see that very fast, so I'll keep the main finding for when we move to the paper. But the idea is that they are always supporting the ideas. Every figure, every table, every result has a meaning that is to show the main finding makes sense and it, to support the, this idea. So let's move to the paper and see how it's going to be like. So in, in the abstract, more than half of it is about the experiment, you know, from color yellow, green, blue, and pink. Each color is a different part of the experimental design. That's why I highlight it differently. But as you can see, more than half of it, of the abstract, is about the experimentation part. So in the yellow, they talk about their proposal. They propose two ideas, the first one, the second one, and a description of what these ideas are. In the green part, they, they comment about the comparison. They are using genetic programming to construct models on data sets. These data sets have constraints that are needed to be addressed. They empirically compare the performance utilizing game theoretic solutions. In the blue part, they talk about how they, what are the metrics, how do they do that? They, the methods are assessed based on the ability to generate trade-offs of supergroup fairness and accuracy, and they operate optimal. Okay. Finally, in the purple part, they show the main result. The main result show that genetic programming methods in general are good, and that the random search, and I highlighted it here because this is the main finding, is well suited. So, already in the introduction, in the abstract, you have an idea of what it's going to be like. How they're going to do and what is the main finding okay introduction so they make a summary of the experiments that were introduced in the abstract here they are further developing the idea so it's the yellow part now becomes a little bit bigger you know connecting to the yellow part of the abstract um, the experiment uh, is, is a little bit small but because they are going to have a full section later on as well as the results, you know, this part, just two lines, because you're going to talk a lot about this in, in a whole section. So in yellow, they explain the proposal, in green, they remind us of the comparison, um, randomized search heuristics, game theoretic approach, again, connecting here to capture, to capture subgroup fairness, um, it was subgroup fairness here. Then in pink, they showed, uh, in purple, sorry, they showed the results. Again, random search, random search, GP, the grand um, genetic programming methods. They do well, but GP is super good. So it's very nice. You can connect everything together. So move on to the experiment, the main important part for us. So in yellow here, they start giving a description of the problem. Again, as in the paper before, the, the problem itself is not what they are interested in, so they give a small explanation. 
it's important to know the main characteristics of this, this problem. So there are four data sets. Um, they are related with this work, you may check. The details of the data sets and the properties are in table one. If you move to table one, you can see a lot of information about this. So name of the data set, source, outcome, and so on and so forth. I, uh, what is most important about it? So each of these classification problems contains sensitive information. So that's why they want to be fair. Two of them concern models about admission schools, so law school and student. The other two are about credit assignments, so they are also connected. So among the four, there are two groups. This is important. There is a small focus because this, the focus of this problem is on the methods, not on the problems. In pink, again, as in the other work, they show the code for reproducibility. Um, and I'm re remembering you that replication of results is the base of the good experimentation. Don't forget to do that yourself. When we move to the green part, highlighted here, this is where they introduce the models and describe the most important models, the Jerry Fair and the Fit. They say those are more, probably they are more important because they are the ones they proposed introduced. So that's why they uh, get into more details. Because it's something new, because it's something that they, this is the main part of the problem of this, this paper, so they give more time, you know, with just one paragraph to introduce the idea of the problems. Another paragraph just for one method. The second one, it is expanded in two paragraphs. Then we have another paragraph talking about the other methods and then how we are going to conduct some some of the parameters, like the repetitions, how they're going to split the data, this is important in machine learning, how they train the models, how and also how, where they run and how they do it. So you can see that there is a lot of information about the models, but not so much on the data sets, because the data sets are not the important part, the models are. So if we move on to section 4.1 here, we see in yellow, the first part, that they reason why they're going to use this FP and FN violation metrics. They say, okay, in order to get a richer measurement of subgroup fairness for evaluation classifiers, there is this uh, current, current and all develop an audition method that we employ here for validation classifier. So why are you using this metric? These metrics are not common. They are somewhat specific. So they give an explanation. What do the metrics do? How to calculate them? what the variables in those metrics mean and what they are for, and then they explain how they are going to use these metrics in their paper. So this is super important. If the metric is unknown, you should explain how do you use the metric, how, what does the metric uh, work, how you can calculate it, but most importantly, all the time, you should give an explanation why you're using a met any metric. So, moving on to the another group of metrics here in yellow on the right, we have the, the accuracy. This is a common metric, so there is no much explanation of how does it work, why they are using it, sorry, how does it work, or how to calculate and everything, but they still give the reason why they are using it. In order to measure accuracy, they use between, they use two metrics, the first one, and the second one, again, because this is smaller, because this, um, these metrics are common, we do a smaller um, de description. However, when we move to this yellow part here, they describe the... sorry, um, I, this is already talked, so moving on to section 4.3 here. Again, the reason why they are using the metric, giving some references so you can take a look on, on more information. They even show how they are going to adapt the output of one of the models to fit into this metric. So how to use is also important. How they are going to uh, use this metric for comparison. And because this is a less common metric, they develop it in more depth. So again, if the metric is unknown or not so common, describe it in details, show 
how you can get more information, how you're going to adapt the models, how you're going to use the metric of a comparison. But in any case, if the metric is known or unknown, if it's common or uncommon, always give the reason why you're using it. Okay, so moving on to the result uh, section in green. Here, they, sh they again show where to find the results. They are in figure 3. If you can move to figure 3, you're going to find information about the results. Um, they analyze the box plots, so another tool that we learned in the class, to give an overall idea of what the results are. This is good for starting the analysis, like what direction should I be, should I move? We can, because we can see general trends from box plots. So, for example, they observe that the GP-based approach, the genetic programming-based approaches, do quite well compared to Jerry Fair. So, Jerry Fair is the first one here, generally quite some lower performance. In terms of finding good uh, parameter front, every GP variant has a higher uh, performance compared to Jerry Fair or Jerry Fair B, GB. J fair and J fair JB, the first two always with a lower performance. So moving on to this part here, they show the main result that they got after just looking at the box plot. Box plot. They see that the random lex and flex tend to produce the best results. And they move on to, to explain why random search performs the best, you know, it performs the best on these two, legs on the other two, and everything. This is so nice. Remember that they already talked about random search performing well. So that's why it's highlighted here, underlined in red, because we, we are just getting, okay, the first set of results and already seeing that random search is very good for this problem. When we move to the second part here, they present the statistical analysis results showing that more information is on figure 4. If you move to figure 4, you're going to get more information. You're going to have the hyper volume performance and also the statistic information. They use the test to support their comments and they use the Wilcox test in a pairwise manner. So they are using the non-parametric test, this is Wilcoxon test, because the hypervolume values do not follow a normal distribution. They violate the CLT, so we cannot use a parametric test. We have to use non-parametric as the Wilcoxon test. They didn't show in this paper, but in your report, don't forget to do that, to show that your data follow or, not, or do not follow the, uh, the normal distribution. They are also test in a pairwise manner because they run different algorithms in different problems. So they want to consider how each pair, problem and um, algorithm, performs compared to another one. This is so that we minimize the impact of noise or among, um, among problems. Okay, moving on to the next green uh, highlighted area here. They give a full paragraph just to describe the statistical analysis. The re results are, are in accord with everything that we found before. Again, for example, we see that random search has the best rankings across uh, hypervolumetrics measurements, so connecting with the results they found before and with the explanation in the introduction and in the abstract. Um, they also comment about non-statistical results as, they did, as the other paper did, but in this case they just said, okay, uh, we saw that, but we don't, I'm not going to explore it. However, this shows that you are understanding what you are doing. You are looking at the data, you're not looking at only at the statistical differences, but you're also looking at the non-statistical uh, significant differences. You are looking on everything, you are showing that you understand what you are doing, and that you get the idea or uh, what the data is telling you. So the last green part here, last part of the paper I want to show you today, and we can see that the results are in agreement with the other ones. So they move on to hypervolume measures in terms of Pareto fronts in figures five and six. So things like this, 
they, they are not so easy to understand, so I'm not going to get into detail, but the idea, for example, is that they find that in figure six, for example, um, all methods are dominated by another one, the random search. We're not surprised by this anymore, right? But the good part is that we see that even with a new set of analysis, random search is doing well. So if you see, the ideas are well connected. The explanation of the why random search is good for these problems is um, supported by many different set of um, results and comments. Does the, the, this repetition make the idea quite convincing? You, it's hard to go against saying, okay, run search, maybe maybe not so good. Okay, so thank you for your attention. This is the end of my comments on this paper.